Insurance fraud has hit epidemic levels in the UK. It costs more than £1.3 billion a year. That's nearly £3.6 million a day. Deliberate crashes, bogus personal injuries, even phantom pets. The fraudsters are risking more and more to make a quick killing, and every year it's adding more than £50 to your insurance bill. But insurers are fighting back, exposing just under 15 fake claims every hour, armed with the latest fraud-busting technology. The subject out the vehicle. Including covert surveillance systems, sophisticated data analysis techniques, and specially trained fraud investigators, they're catching these chances red-handed. Instead of getting away with it, more and more of these fraudsters are being caught out and claimed and shamed. Today, when a flood ruins a house, the claimant hatches an outrageous plan. This individual had been in the local village pub bragging and boasting that he was wishing to defraud the insurer. Because once this call is finished, you could get arrested. Pothole panic when a personal injury case comes in. Cardiff Council noticed that the defect was there and the claim is worth £175,000. And one girl's gadget goes up the creek. I managed to lose my GoPro on my head when I was kayaking. But her claim could end up sinking. We've actually been made aware by another insurer that you actually um, made a claim with them for the same incident. Um, can I ask for your comments on that, please? I feel that I forgot. Insurers spend millions tackling dishonest claims from fraudsters and opportunists. But despite the many high-tech tools at their disposal, their most powerful ally in the fight against insurance fraud is the general public. Tip-offs from people who are not prepared to stand by in the knowledge that others are profiting by submitting fraudulent claims can save countless hours of investigation and stop these opportunists in their tracks. Water can wreak havoc in our homes, so an insurance policy that covers our buildings and contents can be a real lifesaver, with many insurers dispatching emergency tradesmen to get us up and running again as quickly as possible. But when it comes to wading through spurious claims, many insurers turn to fixes of their own. ICOG is a specialist claims management company that uses various techniques to flush out the genuine claims from the bogus. We can actually tell when someone is lying over the phone. Not only do we go through the model and kind of various topics that we need to explore with the customer, we also listen to how they respond to those. And we use 28 behavioural indicators that are signs of deception. When an insurer was getting bogged down with a building claim, it referred the matter to Tara. This was a claim that for a water leak from the central heating that had caused extensive damage to walls, flooring and ceiling. When there's an escape of water claim, obviously customers have various options depending on who their insurer is. So normally the insurer will either appoint one of their own repair firms to fix the damage or the customer can submit their own uh, invoices um, to assess what the cost would be for them to do it themselves. And this policyholder knew exactly what he wanted. The claimant was pushing for a cash settlement of £15,000. On the surface, the claim seemed absolutely fine because an incident had happened. There was no reason to, to not cash settle because, in essence, a genuine invoice had been presented to them. But something had caught Tara's attention. There was what I call a behavioural red flag where the customer was complaining and he was very aggressive directly with the insurance company because he was constantly pushing for the cash settlement to happen quicker. It was time for Tara to speak to the claimant and she had one clear goal. The aim and objective being quite simple, it's a search for the truth. Tara's training would be critical to getting honest answers. Tara Shelton from ICOG, how are you doing? Yeah. Not a problem. Very good, thank you. Uh, my role right. today is to do the right thing, and hopefully you will too. Um, yeah. Have you made a genuine claim? Yes. So I, I got videos um, on my phone where um, they asked me to video 
the water leaking down to the ceiling into, into, the, into the living room. OK. I need to make you aware of, of a few things. Yes. The insurance company had already received some anonymous tip-offs with vital information. The phone calls were actually from three completely different people, and they were members of the community who felt very strongly. The information within the call recordings was quite clear that this individual had been in the local village, pub, shops, etc., and was, uh, if you like, bragging and boasting that he was wishing to defraud the insurer. It's my duty to share with them what our findings are and certainly hope that he's human enough to be honest and, and tell the truth. Your insurance company um, has received three anonymous phone calls right. about you. Yep. This first call was received on the 18th of July, a day after the verbal agreement to offer you a cash settlement. This individual knows that he is your insurance company. Right, okay. Knows you very well and said that you're making a fraudulent claim. Hmm, I think that person is wrong, I think. Okay, well, let, let, let's go through it. They said that he's flaunting around the pub that he's getting thousands as he's getting the work done much cheaper. He's telling people at the pub he'll make £9,000 cash and get the rest of the house done up. Well, the end of the day, I've got, I've got a leak in the house. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not right. a human thing. Do you yeah. can't make a judgment on this call. I can't help you after this phone call. Tara had put her cards on the table. I think that person is, is wrong. Well, I don't right. believe you, and I have to explain why. There is no way court in the UK would believe that a person would make an accusation against you with information that only you could know and part of that information is the value of the claim. It was at this point Tara revealed the ace up her sleeve. So the second call they say that they know that the quote that you received was for around the 14,000 mark but you're getting it done for about 3,000 pounds and that's what he's going around telling everyone. Well, I haven't said that, honestly. So the third call yes. he received was on the 23rd of July. Someone I know is insured with you. He's getting the whole house done on you as works are much cheaper with kind of the new person that you'd appointed to, to fix it. He then said he's absolutely disgusted with you and what you're doing. Three independent accusations. Would this be enough for the claimant to concede defeat? Somebody just got it in for me, I think, and uh, I'm going to have to take it on the chin, aren't I? You know, be I honest with me here, because once this call is finished, you could get arrested. Right, so yeah. I need you to be man enough to make this problem go away and do the right thing. Of course, yeah, yeah. You know, I just want my own back to where it was. Right. The leak. These three yeah. people... Yeah would actually be willing to stand up in court and tell them on oath what you've said. Yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. The claimant still wasn't phased, but Tara had even more evidence. This time, a text message that had been sent to the original builder who had provided a quote for the work, telling him his services were no longer required. This message had been sent just over a month after the claimant decided on a cash settlement. So you've lied saying the insurance company are doing it, but that's not the case. Right, right. That's a lie. Yeah. Yeah. It was starting to unravel. So Tara explained the potential consequences of pursuing an exaggerated claim. I would literally screen through every phone bill you've got and identify who that knew supplier for the three grand work would be. I would go to people in the pub and the village and get court compliant statements from them. You would then potentially, if you got a criminal record, um, lose your job. And he would be put on the fraud register. Yeah. What will happen is you won't be able to get insurance for your car, your house, anything. Anything, yeah. Also life insurance and, yeah. So you understand that? I understand that, yeah. He um, had such a good working relationship with me on the phone that he trusted me enough to make the right decision of what to do. Well, obviously, you think people are uh, coming in and doing the work, now he's doing it cheaper. I can't deny that. I wasn't going to make £10,000 out of it. 
So what were you roughly right. looking to make? Um, probably somewhere, around about 500 pounds. Okay. So obviously I was going to have to do my bathroom after that then. Because obviously they, I need a new bar, a toilet. Okay. I'm going to treat myself to a, a spa bar. Okay. And then you took for being on it. Yeah, I'm just here to see how it's going to be. I think this was just a genuine person who, when he saw that invoice, became exceptionally greedy and had no concept of uh, what he was doing in, in the initial stages. The claim was declined, invoking the fraud condition, and the policy was voided as if it never existed. Now, that customer, for the rest of his life, has a legal obligation to disclose that he had a, a claim declined for fraud. His actions could have resulted in prosecution and potentially a criminal record. I think he had the fright of his life that day. Uh, I would be highly, highly surprised if he would even risk uh, doing that again. Later, when a missing watch turns up, it's not good news for the claimant. They made reference to the fact that they'd been presented with ID documents for the person selling the watch. Lo and behold, that turned out to be our policyholder. Potholes and loose paving stones can cause all manner of trips, resulting in injuries such as broken bones and torn ligaments, costing councils more than £2 million in payouts. But not all of the 10,500 claims that local authorities receive annually are genuine. Upkeep of your own home can involve a never-ending list of jobs, from roof repairs to a lick of paint. But when you have a whole city to maintain, it's a mammoth task. Local councils are responsible for a host of things, collecting your bins, trimming your bushes, and making sure that public highways and byways are not an accident waiting to happen. So when a casino worker had an unlucky fall on one of their pavements, Cardiff City Council was faced with a claim for compensation, and it called on travellers to handle it. Mr. Shibangu presented a personal injury claim. He alleges that he fell off his push bike as a result of a paving defect. The front wheel of his bicycle went into some of the holes where the bricks were missing on the paving, and the back wheel came off of the ground, and he had to take his feet off the pedals to put out onto the floor to support himself. And when his right foot hit the floor, it landed in a twisting motion, which caused him to break his ankle. The injury was quite serious. He'd suffered a, a significant break to his right ankle, which required pins and, and metal work in there to help kind of rebuild it and support his ankle going forward. And Mr. Shibangu wanted Cardiff Council to foot the bill. So the claim is worth £175,000. This is broken down of legal costs, medical costs, his inability to work, and compensation for the injuries he sustained. It was not looking good, and he firmly laid the blame at Cardiff Council's doorstep. Councils have an obligation to ensure that all the highways are kept up to a reasonable standard and have a series of inspections in order to ensure that that's the case. In this case, Cardiff had noticed that the defect was there, that Mr Shibangu alleged that he'd fallen in, and rectified it soon after this alleged incident had taken place. The pavement may have been fixed, but Mr Shibangu had gathered evidence before this happened. He presented some photographs of uh, a defect that he alleged caused the incident. This was some brick paving along Atlantic Wharf where some of the bricks had come away and also had, had moved up and were kind of out of shape. The photos supported his allegation, and of course Mr Shibangu had a badly broken ankle as physical proof. There was nothing that we'd established that went to suggest that there was anything untoward. Um, the injuries that he sustained were genuine. His hospital records and medical records showed that he had actually suffered an injury. Further investigation led Aidan to two passers-by who had seen Mr Shibangu take a tumble and had gone to assist him. So a couple who witnessed the incident had called an ambulance, stayed with him until the ambulance arrived. Our own lines of inquiry meant that we gathered uh, a 999 call, which you could hear the witnesses who were helping Mr Shibangu say where the incident took place. Hello, uh, I want an ambulance. Yeah, what's the phone? I want an ambulance. The emergency, please. He's going away. And where's that to? CS10 4JF. I just had the, uh, uh, okay. the guy just Confirm. fell one month. 
Come through in the full address again to make sure we got it right. Galleon Way, PFN, 4JF. But Mr. Shibangu had said the incident took place on Atlantic Wharf, which was around a 10-minute walk from Galleon Way. There were very obvious discrepancies between the two different versions of events. And the location wasn't the only difference. When did okay. this happen? Uh, just now, just now. OK, and what caused the fall? It was the floor slippery. He was okay. riding his bike in this kind of Is slippery. It... No mention of loose pavement slabs, and the paramedic report also confirmed the different address. It is impossible that Mr Shibangu could have had this incident at Atlantic Wharf. The incident took place at Galleon Way. The whole claim was now on very uneven ground, and Aidan had one more card to play. He presented a loss of earnings claim as a result of having to change his role from a barman and a cleaner to becoming a security guard. He said that his new role as a security guard would mean he'd spend less time on his feet, so he'd be more capable of doing that role. But when Mr Shibangu's wage slips from before and after the accident were compared, they just didn't add up. So Aidan got in touch with the tax office to see if he could flush out the truth. He was actually earning more as a security guard than he was as a barman or a cleaner. And ultimately, you can't present a loss of earnings claim for a personal injury case if you haven't suffered a loss of earnings. We provided Mr Shibangu's solicitors with a transcript of the 999 call, the ambulance report we'd received from the paramedics, our concerns around the exaggeration of his claim and also the kind of misrepresentation of his loss of earnings. Collectively, that, made that, that meant that they decided to drop him as a client. But far from stepping down... Mr Shibangu sought to represent himself for the next two weeks. I was shocked that he continued to present the claim. Um, he was without legal representation and he knew he was lying. I think he'd wrapped himself up in, in so many lies and he'd committed so much to this, to this fraudulent claim that ultimately he still thought he could probably get it over the line on his own, but he just simply couldn't and inspire the discontinuance with the court. £175,000 was not coming his way, but something else was. Councils will compensate genuine claimants for genuine injuries. If they're presented with fraudulent claims, they'll do everything in their power to ensure that they're brought to justice. And Travellers' Insurance take a robust stance to fraud. We referred this matter to the police because the fraud was so blatant in this case and of such high value that we believed that a prosecution was necessary and also to support our customer, Cardiff Council. Mr Shibangu was called in for questioning. Subsequent to that interview, they provided all their evidence to the Crown Prosecution Service and he was sent to court for a charge of fraud by false representation. Having been charged, he was now due at court, but there was another surprise in store. He pleaded not guilty at trial. Uh, the evidence against him was, was overwhelming and he offered no defence of any kind. Whereas the police had gathered compelling proof he had been lying. So ambulances have a black box system similar to aircraft that record data such as GPS tracking and the speed of the ambulance. The GPS tracking data supported the 999 call and the ambulance report by showing the ambulance's destination after it had been called. And the destination? Galleon Way. He was uh, found unanimously by the jury to be guilty. It took them 20 minutes to come to this verdict. It was a really short period of time. And the judge handed him down a sentence of three years, six months. I've been a fraud investigator for 10 years, and I've never seen a sentence handed down of such significance for a single act of fraud. A victory for the city of Cardiff and for travellers. I'm pleased with the outcome of this case. Insurance fraud is not a victimless crime, regardless of who it's committed against. Mr Shibangu has attempted to take money from Cardiff Council unsuccessfully, and this is money out of the public purse. I've never seen a sentence handed down as harsh as this. And it's ironic that Mr Shibangu worked in a casino because he's taken a gamble on this case and it's not paid off for him. Imagine this. You lose a valuable item and as hard as you look, you just can't find it. Fortunately, it's covered by an insurance policy, so you are able to submit a claim and be reimbursed for your loss. That's all well and good. 
But what if you then find the lost item? Of course, you should notify your insurer and refund any money you've been paid. However, for some people who find themselves in this position, the temptation to say nothing at all can be all too great. After all, how could they possibly be found out? Going on holiday can be stressful and can often lead to things being misplaced. This can be anything from laptops, sunglasses, wallets and cameras to your dignity when there are drinks and a dance floor involved. Whether it's a sunshine getaway or a weekend break, millions of us go on holiday every year. So it's fair to say that there are missing items all over the world. Fortunately for the forgetful, there's insurance, and LV deals with a mountain of claims from customers whose prized possessions have gone walkies. So this matter relates to a watch that was left on holiday by our policyholder. He alleged that he forgot to pack the item and then returned home without it. The watch on this particular occasion was worth £3,800. Making his weekend caravan break a very expensive one. And I was kicked down when the incident happened you're looking to claim for. Well, it's this weekend we've been on holiday and we've come back through not that my watch. I've rung this site and they're now saying they can't find it in the caravan we stopped in. You know what date that was? Last time I went all in it was Sunday when I wore it on the 19th. You reported it to the local police? No, I didn't even think to call the local police. I just contacted the site, that's all. Okay. In terms of any um, extension claims for any lost items, um, we require that they are reported to the police, so it would require some form of um, reference. Right, um, yeah. And you said this would be Omega, what do you said you have on the policy? Yeah, Omega thing last year. If you can please um, forward on to any take proof of purchase you may have or take photos of yourself with the watch or anything like that for us as well, just to help validate the claim on our end. As part of our investigation, he was able to provide us with a copy of the purchase receipt, the box, confirmation of his holiday trip, as well as the police report. Having received the necessary documents, LV also got its investigator to put in a call to verify some facts. So when you went away on this holiday, yeah, what watch were you wearing when you went away? The watch I was wearing was uh, my Omega. So it was the only watch you took, or did you take any other watch? Yeah, it was the only one I took, wasn't it? So when you went on holiday then, uh, to the caravan, where was the watch located most of the time? Well, I got it on the wrist when I got there, I took it off while, while I was there, and then I, I kept putting it back on like on the night. If you were wearing the watch when you went away, why, why wouldn't you continue wearing it to, when, when you returned home? I got to put everything away, got the kid to sort out and everything, so that was the last thing I thought about putting it on. And when you were packing up to go, where did you think the watch was? I'd have left it on the side um, next to the bed where we were sleeping. That's where I used to put it, somewhere there. How, how would you have managed to have missed it when you were leaving? Well, I'm not sure, like, my wife packed up, but also I've got a little girl that's only two, what we're in out of the bedroom, so I don't know if she, she could have knocked it off the side. And when did you find it was not there? Uh, Monday afternoon, once we got back and sorted everything out. Did you contact the police? I contacted them again Monday afternoon. I think that's all I needed from you. Thank you very much for your time there. Based on our investigation and the evidence that have been provided, we had no reason to disbelieve this was nothing but a genuine claim and proceeded to pay in full. So the claim was paid, but not before the details of the watch were entered into a worldwide database for lost and stolen watches. Case closed? Not quite, because some months later, LV received a call to say the watch had turned up at a jewellery shop. Following purchase of the watch, the jeweller carried out a series of checks one of those checks included checking the central register where he identified that the watch had been subject to a claim with LV. When contacting LV to make us aware that they had this watch in their custody, they made reference to the fact that they'd been presented with ID documents for the person selling the watch. This mystery person could have been someone who'd found the watch or potentially the person who'd taken it in the first place. Lo and behold, that turned out to be our policyholder. That's right, it was the claimant himself who had sold the watch to the jewellers. Following receipt of this information, we contacted our policyholder to challenge him in relation to this new information. The excuse for him having the watch back in his possession was it had turned up at home. It'll come as no surprise that this was an explanation LV wasn't prepared to accept. In that conversation, he did offer to pay us back in full for the value of the claim. 
Despite the claimant's promises, LV was left waiting and never received a penny. But if the claimant thought burying his head in the sand would make this go away, then he was sorely mistaken. So we passed our file of papers to our lawyers who wrote to the policyholder, and he has since paid us back in full. Still to come, cold calling sharks getting people to put in bogus whiplash claims get caught in the act. No, I'll give you a tip with how claims work. The more parts of your body that you had in discomfort, the more money you'll get. Nobody's ever going to try to prove or disprove what you said. Some scammers treat insurance like an all-you-can-eat buffet, a never-ending supply of settlement cash for greedy fraudsters who chance everything to grab a piece of the pie. But for some people, a life without risks can be a boring one. And if you're an adrenaline fueled travel addict, there's always insurance. So there's no need to sweat it if you break a bone or a pricey gadget disappears in the back of beyond. Seeger, a Charles Taylor company, handles claims for multiple insurer clients. So whichever company you have a policy with, it might end up being handled by one of Seeger's teams. The customer contacted our claims department to make a claim for a lost GoPro camera, which went missing on a holiday to Uganda. The customer told us that while she was kayaking, the GoPro camera, which was attached to her protective helmet, fell off. The value of this claim was £390. The circumstances of the incident were entirely plausible, and initially we had no reason to disbelieve the customer. How can I help? I was on holidays recently in Africa and I managed to lose my GoPro on my head when I was kayaking. I was just wondering, I don't know whether or not I'd be able to claim for it on my holiday insurance. It's certainly something that we can look into for you. You said the GoPro was attached to your head when you were kayaking. Yeah, so basically, I, the GoPro was attached to a helmet on a mount. And I went over and I hit a rock which dislodged the mount from my helmet so the GoPro then sank. Okay. Just got it for Christmas. Oh no. Uh, so I'll get this claims information pack sent out to you. It will ask you a few questions about insurance which I will go through with you now. Whilst taking the initial call, the claims advisor was also doing some checks. We did a previous claim search and could see that the customer had in fact made a claim previously just three days before. So at this point, Seeger needed to ask more questions about policies. Do you have any other travel insurance? No. OK, and have you uh, pursued a claim for this or any other insurance? No. So what I can actually do for you is I can get this uh, forwarded across to my claims validation team and someone that will be in contact with you. OK, thank you. At that point, we didn't disclose to the customer exactly what we knew. It is entirely plausible that the customer may have owned two GoPro cameras, but it was clear we'd need to have a chat with her to find out whether that was the case. But before doing this, Seeger called up all the files. After reviewing the detail of the previous claim, the location of the incident was exactly the same, the item she was claiming for was the same, and the date of the loss was also the same. It was clear that the customer was in fact making the same claim. It was time for the validation team to dive in and confront this double accounting. We just wanted to have a quick chat with you regarding what's happened. Um, I'm aware that it's your GoPro camera um, that's been lost in Uganda, is that right? Yeah. Okay, can you just tell me what actually happened in that incident, please? I was kiting down the River Nile. I capsized. I hit my head off a rock, and then the camera sank. Okay, I understand. And were there any other incidents during the trip um, where any other personal possessions weren't missing at all? No. Okay, that's fine. In relation to your current policy, and I'm aware that it's um, like a pack policy, a travel pack that comes with a yeah. um, sort of added benefits. Um, yeah. What benefits was it that you were under the impression um, that the uh, account had when you took it out? And claiming for something twice would not be the right answer. 
they can cover it and travel insurance. Okay, so you you were aware of the travel insurance at the time? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Do you hold any other policies that will cover this incident, or have you claimed, or are you claiming this anywhere else? No. Okay, so within the insurance industry, um, insurers share um, data in order to detect and prevent fraudulent claims um, and to detect or prevent um, crime. Now, just in relation to your claim, um, we've actually been made aware by another insurer that you've actually uh, made a claim with them for the same incident. Um, can I ask your comments on that, please? Yeah, um, I just basically, I have another one as well. I had two GoPros. Okay, so, so what happened in that instant? It was a similar situation where I was swimming and it came off my head. Okay, because I, I asked you earlier in the call whether there were any other instances of, of loss during the trip and you said there weren't and confirmed it was only the one GoPro that went missing. At this point, she seemed to be up the creek without a paddle. Oh, sorry. Okay, so also, because we've shared information with the other insurer, we've actually been able to get a copy of their file. Um, and when you registered the claim with them, you were asked if you had any other insurance, and you said that you hadn't. Okay. And I'm just trying to understand why you would have told them that if you were aware of this policy. I, I don't know, because I suppose I wasn't sure if, if my insurance would come through. Okay, but why wouldn't you tell them about it if they'd asked? I suppose I, I forgot. For us, this was not a reasonable explanation because she had already been through the claims process just three days before and a £390 payment had already been issued. Her chances of successfully claiming for the same gadget twice were sinking fast. I'll give you the opportunity to be open and honest with me. It certainly appears that you've claimed for the same item twice. Um, it is better to be honest with me at this point. Is that the case? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. We, we won't be paying any part of your claim. Um, I will be writing to you outlining our position within five working days. We'll also need to make your other insurer aware of what's happened as well. Okay. Thanks very much for your time today. Okay, thank you. Bye. On this occasion, I think the customer just got a bit greedy when she realised that she had two insurance policies that possibly could pay her out for the same claim. And maybe she thought £390 was small fry. Sega have a zero-tolerance approach to fraud, regardless of the value of the claim. We then referred the matter through to our client, the underwriter of the insurance policy, who decided to refer the matter on to the police. We later found out that the police did take formal action against the customer because she accepted a police caution for fraud by false representation. We've all been there. The phone rings and rather than it being your favourite friend or someone you actually want to speak to, it's a pushy stranger asking you about the accident you never had or promising you free cash that's been put aside with your name on it. Consumers have been bombarded with nearly three billion of these nuisance calls and texts a year. So it's no wonder we're frustrated, but things are changing. The government is now cracking down with fines of up to half a million pounds for these cold calling sharks. Calls about accident insurance claims are now illegal. So if you're on the receiving end of one of those, it's definitely a rogue company. Horwich Farrelly is a specialist law firm that represents insurance companies and is well versed in dealing with cases involving claims management companies. This next case demonstrates the lengths that some of them will go to. We were instructed to investigate a very minor incident uh, in which a claim had been brought for an accident that happened in a car park by a mother and her daughter. Their car and a transit van had collided, resulting in injuries to both women. The claimants didn't receive any medical treatment, uh, but were examined by a medical professional who was instructed by their solicitors. The medical report said that both claimants had sustained whiplash injuries lasting between six and nine months. The fact that the women were claiming to have been in pain for so long, despite the minor nature of the collision, raised some questions. We were instructed to investigate the claims because there was a dispute over whether or not the claimants were genuinely injured. It went through our in intelligence team who carried out investigations into the claimant which, all, which included uh, looking on Facebook. 
On the day of the accident, there had been a post. In addition to this... During the time that she said she was injured, she was actually doing various activities. And it wasn't attending a book club or a genteel art class. David passed on the findings to her solicitors. And they decided that they could no longer represent the claimants and came off the court record. Horwich Farrelly wrote to the claimant to inform her of her predicament. However, her response was the last thing they were expecting. She contacted us to say that she'd been harassed over a long period of time and was eventually persuaded to bring the claim by a claims management company. The company had promised her that there was a pot of money waiting for her, um, that her claim wouldn't be challenged, that it'd be straightforward, and all she had to do was submit the claim to the insurance company. It had started as a cold call, but had soon escalated into being harassed for many months. And when there was a family tragedy and she was most vulnerable, she gave in and submitted a claim for injuries she didn't have. When we were told the name of the claims management company, um, our intelligence team searched that against other cases that had been presented against our insurer client and discovered that we had in fact come, come across them before. Three years earlier, whilst trading under a different name, the same company had been representing a mother and her three children for whiplash injuries. On that occasion, Horwich Farrelly had been called in for exactly the same reasons as it was now. We were instructed on the basis that this was a very minor incident and that injury was very unlikely. And that previous investigation had resulted in the discovery of a very interesting phone call recording. Between the claimant's partner and uh, our insurer client, but unusually, also on the call was the same claimant's management company. I know the accident date you're looking for. Uh, the date of the accident, yeah, please. The accident date? Yes. Hello? Yes. Hello, I, I'm sorry, mate. Yeah, yeah, I'm well, well, the solicitors who are dealing with your client. Sorry, our, our client lost his documentation. Yeah, my client's after the accident date. And what are you doing for our client? Sorry? What are you doing for our client? Sorry, is that any of your concern? To have someone from the claims management company as a third party on the call was far from common. Typically, when accidents are reported, uh, there wouldn't normally be a claims management company involved at that stage. If, I give you, point if you're, you want to give us authorization, yes, I'm giving more authorization, yes. And you tell me help you? Um, yes, um, well, just after the claim reference number four, uh, well, first of all, the date. Um, of the incident, rare under it was. You said it was a taxi, wasn't it? Reversed into the back of your car, yeah. It was, I don't know what the name is, I think it's Moston Street. Okay, yeah, have you located it? It was 2012, I believe. Have you located um, the incident? Right, the accident date is 22nd of November, 11. Yeah. Oh, 11. All right, you're a star. Thank you. After the initial details were provided, the conversation continued after that between the claims management company and the claimant's partner. Insurance companies record all of their phone calls, and what happened in this case is that the call continued to record after the claims management company and the policyholder thought they'd hung up. What was said was very revealing. Oh, my word, but that's it now. We've got everything, everything. As I said before, I don't want to raise your hopes too high. All right, yeah. because you didn't go to the hospital. It's just put it, right. What they do is they'll, they'll set money aside and set us because you're going here from the back. They assume you would have had either minor neck or shoulder or back discomfort. Can I be honest with you? It's the one thing. Of course, yeah. I did try to make a claim in for whiplash for that, and I heard nothing back of them. Well, right, so you're already making a claim. Well, you know, we're going back now to 2011 and I still haven't heard anything. So yeah, I see um, they've like, just forgotten about it. Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. I didn't sign anything. You, you didn't sign anything? No, no. Oh, then that's fine. You, you just spoke to them. I just spoke to them. And that's they fine. They back to me, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> if not, I'll give you a tip with how claims work, right? Even if you just put down a file that you had minor discomfort in your shoulder, you're going to get paid out. The more parts of your body that you had in discomfort, the more money you'll get. Yeah. All right? So where should I put down that everybody had their discomforts? Uh, it was in the necks and shoulders. 
That's fine. Just that should work out a decent deal. Now, what's going to happen now is, I'll put you two to the solicitor. These are our solicitors, all right? If you don't get paid, they don't get paid. If you don't get paid out, they don't get paid. Nobody's ever going to try to prove or disprove what you said. It's never going to go to court. And at no point do you ever dip your hand into your pocket to pay a penny. And you will never divulge your bank details. When you get paid out, you get paid out fair check in the post. That's how it works. One of the concerning parts of that call was the fact that the claims management company told the claimant's partner how to present the claim and how to maximise their compensation as well. But now these same cold callers were back on the scene and still coercing people into making bogus claims. So David's team conducted further searches. We discovered through cold calling forums that this company had actually been involved in similar practices on numerous occasions. And there were lots of reports of aggressive cold calling and promising people pots of money with no strings attached. Advertising zero penalties for making a claim was an entire work of fiction. Despite saying that the claims management company was the only reason she actually brought the claim in the first place, she had still decided to go ahead with what was a dishonest claim. So the consequences of that was that the claimant had to repay the insurer's costs of around £4,200. Having discovered that the company was still up to its old tricks, David escalated the case further up the chain. Once we'd completed our investigations, um, we presented all of our evidence to the claims management regulator, and they then subsequently investigated the claims management company. The claims management regulator then contacted us to confirm that the claims management company had surrendered its authorisation and can no longer uh, practice as a claims management company. Uh, this has meant that this company can no longer persuade people to bring claims. That's one claims management company that won't be preying on anyone else. But the problem is still there, and what we all need to be aware of is that by pursuing claims we aren't entitled to, we're the ones who can end up out of pocket, and in some cases, with a criminal record. Whilst unethical um, claims management companies will um, face the consequences from the claims management regulator, uh, claimants also need to understand that where they present dishonest claims, they will also have to pay the costs. Insurance fraud takes all sorts of forms, from organised criminal gangs inducing dangerous road accidents to people bumping up household claims with extra gadgets. We're the ones paying the price. Consumers have to contend with ever more expensive premiums. But the industry and the police are cracking down, and the number of these fraudsters getting caught out sends a clear message to anyone thinking of committing insurance crime. They claimed, but now they're shamed. Police, businesses and the public are on the lookout next on BBC One, catching crooks red-handed.